Hello nurses, this is Kevin with NursingCamp.com and these are my scribble notes on nursing and the NCLEX. Today's focus is on pulmonary lecture number 20, acute respiratory failure or ARF. And we're going to talk about this sticky note found on NursingCamp.com, Facebook, Pinterest, um, Etsy, and social media. All right, let's get into it. All right, when we're talking about acute respiratory failure, in a previous lecture I talked about how um, a patient presents uh, with hypoxemia. Hypoxemia is a result of underlying conditions, but they present with general signs and symptoms. And that's the boat coming. And that's why we teach so much about the boat coming, because problems that you see prevent acute respiratory failure. And failure is the big keyword of this. This is not acute respiratory distress, where acute respiratory distress is the problem of the boat coming. And that's, that's presented in a previous lecture where I talked about hypoxemia. So we covered that a patient generally with the boat coming is problems that you start to see, like tachypnea, tachycardia, restlessness, pallor, hypertension, and shortness of breath. These are all earlier signs. And those signs are the boat coming. When, when the problem is truly here and this patient is starting to fail, um, what starts to happen is they start to show other signs and symptoms. So confusion, cyanosis, bradypenia, bradycardia, hypotension, dysrhythmias, is all that failure is starting to happen. But how do we truly know what acute respiratory failure is? Well, it's exactly in the name. And when you think about it, acute respiratory failure is, um, <clears throat> is exactly what it is. The respiratory system is failing to compensate and so what we start to see is, is that we start to see those signs and symptoms um, like this and then what happens is, is that that patient is no longer oxygenating so they're failure they're in failing all right so how do we know that well we need to have some sort of assessment in order to figure that out and the way that we do that is is that we have to do some um, uh, immediate um, action because the patient's already failing. And that's what we start to do. We draw, draw an ABG, we might draw a sputum, we've got a chest x-ray, we'll get a CBC, ECG, and potentially a swan, depending on how bad the patient is. And I talked about swans in my cardiac lectures. Please see that lecture right there. But what kind of data are we gonna get from this? Well, the first key is, is that what causes acute respiratory failure? The key is, is that they can be a ventilator fa failure, a ventilator problem. It's all the same things that cause acute respiratory distress. So whenever a patient is in distress, they're gonna have these signs and symptoms. And when a patient is in failure, it's usually caused by the same things that cause respiratory distress. Well, there's ventilation failure. So that means that the uh, there's a problem with ventilation where it's not so much a problem with perfusion. And ventilation is like asthma. There's an upper airway problem. PE, there's an actual clot or something in the pulmonary tree. A pneumo is preventing, a collapsed lung that's preventing, this ear is preventing for expansion of this lung, causing a failure. Pulmonary edema, same thing. There's more fluid out here causing less expansion of these vessels of the of the lungs a fibrosis which we talked about in the previous lecture there is no stretch so the the lungs are very stiff and the person can't compensate there's also some neuro factors and i cover this in my neuro lecture and where gillian barre is um g to b right so ground to brain so in gillian barre it goes from the ground to the brain and what happens is, is that they get paralyzed on the way up. And then it hits the lungs. And what happens is, is that causes a ventilator failure. That's different than myasthenia gravis, where myasthenia gravis is M to G, mind to ground. So it starts from the head, and then it moves down to the lungs. Okay, So mind to ground. Same situation like Gillian Barre is it actually paralyzes the lungs, resulting in a ventilator failure. Um, autonomic dysreflexia with the T6, 
um, these patients above T6 um, will get autonomic dysflex dysreflexia. Please see my autonomic dysreflexia lecture in neuro and CVAs. Uh, also ICP, cerebral edema, and um, stroke patients. So ventilator failures is usually because this problem with the actual you know, stretch of the lungs or the respirations are actually happening. That is different than a, um, than a uh, oxygen failure. Now an oxygen failure is a result of some sort of perfusion problem. So like in pneumonia, have all this exudate and all these, uh, this, this consolidation, which happens to be, you can't get airflow through it. And so what happens is, is that increased respirations and you start to see these signs and symptoms where the body tries to compensate for all these symptoms. But what happens is, is that it can't compensate and then they start to go into failure. That's the same thing with a hypoventilation. Hypoventilation is a, is a problem that could be a result of uh, uh, medications like uh, morphine or something like that. Or the patient is um, decreased respiratory rate. Uh, pulmonary edema, also perfusion problems, and a low H and H. There's just not enough hemoglobin to um, to perfuse the the uh, to bring around the oxygen. And then it's carbon monoxide. There's too much CO2 in the blood bound to hemoglobin. All right. So how do we know? So we either have a ventilator failure or an oxygen failure. It shows up some signs and symptoms of um, respiratory distress and then what happens is is that we draw ABGs because what happens is we've already seen the signs and symptoms and now we're trying to figure out is it truly failure and there's an actual formula that we're going to follow and that formula is, is like is from an ABG and the ABG has certain criteria in order to result in respiratory failure and what that means is, is that if the patient's in respiratory failure, that patient needs to be intubated. And these are the blood gases that somebody will intubate somebody under. So a PaCO2 of greater than 50, a PaO2 of less than 60. And we talked about, now normal PaCO2 is normally 35 to 45. And if there's too much acid involved, um, they're going to be really hypercapnic. So they're actually going to have, um, they need to be blown off. So they need to be uh, uh, intubated for that. And then the PaO2. We said the PaO2 in a previous lecture was um, eight, PaO2, 80 to 100. Remember, that's pulmonary artery um, oxygenation. It only can get through, through an ABG. Um, and then that's what we're, when a PaO2 means that's truly oxygenation. If the person is not oxygenating, and it's supposed to be 80, and it's less than 60, they need oxygenation. And that's because of an oxygen failure. Now, a pH of the two acidotic is 7.35 to 7.45, so the two acidotic. And then an SaO2. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about SaO2. Now, in my previous lecture, I talked about SpO2. SpO2 is a pulse ox, okay? Pulse ox, P for pulse ox. SaO2 is the same thing, but it is in an ABG, okay? So it's a truly accurate pulse ox. So that's a different thing about, that's the difference between the SaO2 and the SpO2. Okay, so in the end, when you're having a patient with acute respiratory failure, it is the result of acute respiratory distress from an underlying cause of either a ventilator failure or an oxygen failure. And it's one of these two things. These are the same reasons that causes acute respiratory distress. We're going to anticipate an ABG sputum, maybe a chest x-ray, uh, CBC, ECG to rule out cardiac, and we might also anticipate a swan. Once we get the ABG, we will then evaluate these blood gases to see whether or not this patient should be intubated. Okay, that's about it. My name is Camp, and this is Nursing Camp. In my next lecture, I'm going to talk about a little bit about intubation and um, SARS.
All right, we'll see you next time.